Hello my soccer universe and welcome to the review of match day 4 of the Champions League. Loads of things going on, many interesting storylines, be it Juventus being an absolute shambles in Israel, a referee taking upon himself to ruin the Milan-Chelsea game, yes, fanboy right here, or Napoli still remaining brilliant. I'm realizing a trend here with all the Italian teams here. So quickly, let's do another one with the absolute crazy Group D. And of course, my absolute favorite story with Club Bruges already qualifying for the next round. So many great stories. However, we need to start in Barcelona. We absolutely need to start in Barcelona to uh, take like the first uh, observation where Barcelona's home, dramatic, I need to say, dramatic home draw to Inter puts their whole new project, I think I call it more of a financial finagling and not accepting reality, cause it already very much in question and putting it on, on the brick. And now there's a lot of doom and gloom talk at the moment around Barcelona. Barcelona will survive this. The question is just in what uh, capacity it will do so. And they had it a little bit coming as well. I mean, I think many Barca fans will probably uh, blame the so-called FIFA virus. However, I think they have to not only look at the leadership of their club over the past uh, five to six years. It is just mismanagement. And I have to say, uh, even the new ownership was not better. And I think I would have had much more sympathy for Barcelona if they would have just said, OK, it's going to be a tough couple or three years where we may even not qualify for the Champions League. But maybe let's thin out the squad, let's fill it with young squad players because we have a good core and we move forward from there. No, we, work, we, we go out, we spend money that we don't have, we sell off the club's future and now you're looking down into the abyss. I was about to put him, uh, you know, instead of Camp Nou, say it Camp Doom, but uh, I think that is a pun that doesn't really work well, but it really doesn't look good in Barcelona. It absolutely doesn't look good at Barcelona because if you just look at the pure facts, a win for Inter at home to Victoria Pilsen is enough to see Barcelona eliminated for a second year in a row from the Champions League. And that is a Barcelona team that actually started the season announcing, yeah, we may, we have now the squad to go deep into the Champions League. So, uh, and Barca is back. No, I was not Barca is back. And I think uh, the, the interesting thing is that this group, if you know anything about me, Bayern and Inter are outside of Austria, the two teams that I like to hate the most. Hate, meanwhile, is a strong word. I'm uh, much more level-headed uh, on, on that. But even 10 years ago, when they played in a Champions League final, or 12 years ago, meanwhile, uh, they played in the Champions League final. That's the only Champions League final that I ever that ever was that I did not watch because I boycotted it because to me, this was just the, it, it was Sophie's choice. I mean, it's, it's a, the two teams I hate most playing for the trophy that I covered most in a way. So uh, in that sense, it is really, really ironic that I'm not unhappy of Barcelona being on the brink of elim elimination to those two teams because they honestly, with what they have, have, have been doing, they do not deserve that. They deserve to be shown the bill. This high risk, high stakes game with a huge club, it cannot go. And I hope that Barca fans are actually not behind the team, but they are realizing what a fraud this club has been and there needs to be a change and a little bit more humble pie. That's what I demand from Barca because with so much debt, you cannot run the high state. You just need to eat some humble pie, take a few years where you re rebuild yourself. You have all the opportunities in the world. You're still a destination club. Just take it slow. No. That's the build that you get. So enough of my Barca rant. I honestly want to make a little Bruges rant because <laughs> that to me, when you saw the draw for that group, which was actually, you had a team from uh, Spain, Atletico Madrid. 
admittedly not good in the Champions League. Well, you had FC Porto, the champions of Port Portugal, a team that know that uh, has a quarterfinal in the Champions League always in them. And then you have Bayer Leverkusen, uh, who looked at the beginning of the season much better than they do now. But you would put all of these three teams ahead of Bruges in the draw. Everyone did, including myself. That Bruges already within four games have qualified from this group is just an amazing feat. And what's even more amazing is that in the league they're not, they're not that amazing. And they have lost Charles de Quetelare to Milan, where, yeah, it's still some teething problems there, but uh, you gotta give the, uh, the guy some time. Uh, but they have managed to get out, out of this group and actually convincingly so. I mean, they, the way they rolled over Porto in Portugal. And also uh, completely deservedly defeat Re Atletico Madrid. I was about to say Real Madrid. Atletico Madrid at home tells me everything there is. And they have been two years ago very, very, very close where they almost beat Lazio to make it to the next round. So uh, it is not necessarily coming out of nowhere. However, it is also has to say it comes with a really, um, you know, smallish squad. And uh, the irony is also that uh, Jutkla from Barcelona connection there is actually star for Bruges now and he was a nobody at Barcelona I'm not saying he's a world-class talent or what seven the Barca should have built, have built his uh, bank his future on him no far from but that a Barcelona graduate is thriving outside of uh, Barcelona is something uh, really interesting the jersey that I'm wearing is a Marseille away jersey I, I really love this jersey I don't like Marseille all, all much but I really love this jersey who also had a pretty remarkable turn turnaround because after two uh, rounds they looked down and out and now they beat Sporting Lisbon twice in a row. Sporting Lisbon who has been half flying high in this group. Group D, and that's the last one that I want to end up before we go into the games, is just uh, the most amazing Champions League group because everyone can still get out of it. Now it's not the most amazing one because there's also the group E uh, with Milan, Chelsea, Salzburg and Zagreb where we have a similar um, story. However, there I'm not as neutral as I'm on Group D, so maybe that's why Group D is a little bit more exciting to me. But we'll talk about all that. Let's uh, run through the games. We'll start in Copenhagen, um, where it was a nil-nil draw. I mean, the early um, Tuesday, the early, the, early, the early games, I think the headline is definitely Maccabi Haifa Juve, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to give some credit to uh, Copenhagen, especially the fans who... I'm not your quiet Nordic fan base, uh, which I kind of knew. What amazed me most in the 81st minute, out of nowhere, there was a T for all around the stadium. That is, that was, 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 was amazing. Uh, of course, City, you know, they have to be clash against Liverpool, although it's not as big anymore. Come, come, coming up. Uh, played probably not their strongest squad, and uh, the run of the game was a little bit unlucky for them. Uh, Rodri scored a brilliant opening goal. But uh, Riyad Mahrez handball in the build-up. Then a few minutes later, they get a penalty that Riyad Mahrez uh, cannot convert. Uh, again, I want to say. Um, so he was kind of the tragic figure. And then Gomez is sent off with a red card. And at that moment, it was kind of pretty clear. Yeah, uh, it's not a CC night. Copenhagen had some uh, chances by the end. I think a nil-nil draw suited both of them. Um, the... Win of Maccabi Haifa definitely did not suit Juve, and how bad did Juve look in that one? Both of the goals. This is a team who is famous for their world-class defending. Both of the goals were absolute shambles. How Atzili is having ample of space. I even don't want to excuse uh, Chesney for uh, the second, for 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 the first goal uh, that he he, he conceded. But this is lowly Maccabi. Eva. Yes, they're playing nice and they have been exciting. They even at home at PSG were actually in the in, in, in the game for for a while. But Juventus, there was nothing there. The one thing. There should have been a penalty, I think, uh, that this wasn't given this uh, rough tackle in the box. I think it was on uh, Quadrado. That I found a little bit uh, rough. But, you know, it was not a day for Italian teams and penalties. Because Milan, Chelsea, the referee needed to kill the game. And, yes, um, I'm putting on my Milan fan glasses because uh, that's who I am. I am a huge Milan fan. And let me say, whatever I'm going to say now, I... Do not want to diminish Chelsea here. Chelsea were the better team. Even up until this point, Chelsea were the better team. They probably would have won that game even without. 
Potentially, Milan could have held out a draw, but I think that Chelsea clearly, I mean, if I just look at the midfield, as much as I love my current Milan midfield, what Chelsea has in the middle of the park is simply better. I gotta accept that. What I cannot accept is, and I have to say, when I saw the replay of the scene, it is basically Mason Mount getting on a better side of Tomori, who is not defending well, who kind of pulls him back on the shoulder a little bit, um, and then takes a shot and falls down from the shot. And the referee gives a penalty and a red card. I am actually can probably even live with the penalty, although I think it was a given the Juve challenge. This was an almost nothing, but I understand you hold him back. He was in a better. I even think I know the line of the thinking of the referee is yeah, denying a clear goal um, as goal scoring op opportunity. But what bugs me on this one is this was not a bad tackle whatsoever. This was just a little hand on the shoulder. He let him go. I mean, he actually could control the ball. It was not even a big hindrance in that sense. And for that, you sent off. This was just the referee being, and I have, I have, I have to say, Siebert is one of my least favorite German referees anyway. Uh, the other one is Stieler, of course. He just takes it way too serious everything and decides a game right there and then. Because everyone knew with 10 men and a goal down Milan despite being at home they cannot come back from that and uh to their credit to, to the credit i mean um Giroud had a big chance they could have e equalized and they caught mason mount again being very instrumental getting called a counter -act. obama young makes the game is done and dusted milan tried but chelsea then relatively easily saw that game out um I also found it interesting, Mason Mount, in the, all the discussions around the penalty, got a yellow card, and I saw Gabriele Macotti tweeting, I wonder whether, Gab uh, whether Mount got a yellow, yellow card for arguing that Tomori shouldn't have been sent off. To me, it is less about the penalty, although I have it often seen that such scenes are being let go, and I know exactly VAR, blah, blah, blah. Yes, uh, if the referee decides here on the penalty, VAR is not gonna turn this over. That's the problem here. But... Uh, I just don't, the penalty is, or I, I can kind of live with, I cannot live with this red card. It, it's just a ridiculous, ridiculous decision. And one that actually will implicate Milan, and you know, here's the fan really bleeding, that will implicate Milan for the next round, because Tomori for sure is not playing, and he's the only good central defender that Milan have left. So yeah, uh, it did not, as I said, Milan are so depleted, yes, Theo Hernandez was there, and I do not like that the Milan then afterwards tried to get a Chelsea player sent off. That, that, that was ridiculous, frankly, uh, but I, I knew, uh, knowing Theo Hernandez and seeing him, I, I knew exactly that this is what's going to happen. But yeah, so 2-0 for Milan, now they are all, they are very squarely in third spot and have to uh, hope for a second spot. At least the result in Zagreb went Milan's way, that since there was only a draw. Yes, this means Zagreb are not level with Milan, but it also means that Salzburg are not pull, pulling away Chelsea in the first place. Um, and that was a tight game. Seiwald gave, and he rarely was goes, gave Salzburg lead. Then uh, Zagreb were pushing hard for the equalizer. One was called off for an offside. Uh, Ljubicic uh, then gets one. There was an offside, but you know, it took such a deflection that I think the offside didn't really count. So I think it, it was right that the goal stood. Um, Zagreb had done early on a few, but uh, it wasn't actually Salzburg who probably could have made the, the winning goal and continue their great run. But I think that draw actually keeps the group kind of very much on balance. A uh, group not so much in balance is uh, the group with Real Madrid, where uh, first Leipzig, uh, I have to say a little bit of a lucky win at Celtic. Um, both goals through Werner and Forsberg coming late. I mean, once it was then, it uh, once the goals came, I think the game could, could have only gone the one way. But I also feel a little bit Celtic. Celtic we probably should have gotten some, something out of it. But again, Scottish teams, as we'll see, uh, not performing well in the Champions League, which is all, all, also a shame. Um, but also what keeps the group a little bit interesting is that Real Madrid also did not have, have a good show. And clearly we're looking at the Clásico with their light up. I mean, once they were down a goal... The names they brought on just tells everything. Vinicius Jr. came on, Modric came on, Alaba came on, Kamavinga came on, Asensio came on in a 10-minute span. 
that tells you everything you need to know. They were playing a second string squad, try to see uh, what's gonna happen. And yes, uh, Schachter probably would, would have deserved the win. Uh, Zukov giving them the early, early goal. They had already better chances. And then deep in stoppage time, Antonio Rüdiger gets the equalizer. And I really felt a little bit Schachter because uh, that would have been a famous win for them. Dortmund also had a hands full with Sevilla who took a lead through Nianzu, but then Bellingham equalized. But that was a game that Dortmund barely had under control. A win for Dortmund would have seen them go through together with Man Match. It, uh, it just leaves the lifeline for Sevilla there. But it's a very slim lifeline, as we'll see when we look at the standings. And PSG Benfica just traded penalties. Um, yeah, I mean, the penalty for Benfica to equalize... This was a stupid Veratis challenge because the guy is running outside of the box and he, he, he makes a foul right and in the corner of, 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 of the box. Absolute stupidity right there because there was no need to do that. Uh, of course, PSG have wasted some chance, but also PSG didn't look convincing. And I wonder if a certain um, a French national team player is a little bit unsettling the apple cart too much there. But you saw a little rant in my shorts videos there. Going over to yesterday, again, uh, the um, early games couldn't be, have been much more different, but both equally exciting. I mean, Napoli Ajax was always going to be goal fest. Last time we had seven goals, this time we had six goals, but a little bit more even performances. Uh, Napoli within 50 minutes had squarely put the game under their control. Lozano, and especially goal by Raspadori. I mean, Ajax could, didn't know what was hitting them again. However, they settled into the game. And David Klaassen gave them an equalizer right after that event, just when you thought that Ajax might be pushing for an equalizer. And a point for Ajax would have meant so much because that would have given them a realistic chance to uh, still be in the running for uh, the knockout stages. But it's a penalty, clear hands penalty, then Karaskelia converts 3-1. However, Bergwijn uh, pulls also one back through a penalty, and again, a very stupid penalty. But the game uh, got exciting at that point, point again, but then uh, the Ajax defense implodes with a uh, daily blind hold uh you know playing too much around with with the ball around victor also all Siemen, and suddenly pasvea is running out of his goal and all Siemen just takes a ball of uh blind and puts it in the, in the empty net it was a weird 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 goal uh atletico desperately needed a win over club Bruges, who only needed one single point to qualify and that's the point they got the game was uh they could keep the game open but the longer the game went the more defensive they went and i think Deep in his heart, uh, Diego Simeone must have appreciated that. Simeone threw everything but the kitchen sink at them. I don't think he threw uh, Joao Felicia at them. <laughs> but uh, simply, there were chances in there. I'm looking especially at Alvaro Morata late, late on where he hits Mignolet square in, in the face. But Club Bruges continued their great story and it's just... So fun to see a team from a different nation. Yes, Club Bruges is a big team in Belgium. However, Belgium, it's not a top five league. So it's really great to see another, again, a different nation going deep in there. When you look at the final result between Rangers and Liverpool, you're thinking beat down, beat down. Liverpool were really dominant. Nope. Absolutely not. I have to say, until Firmino makes it 2-1, this was a very even game. Yes, slowly going Liverpool's way. But early on, Rangers had enough chances. And when they took a lead through Arfield, you really had to fear the worst for uh, Liverpool at that point, who are a little bit struggling, we know. But then Firmino gets an e equalizer and the balance shifts a little bit more towards Liverpool. However, that this game then gets so out of hand is something that I think no one expected. Because that game was really, really even. Uh, Nunez makes it 3-1. And then when Salah makes it 4-1, you saw already uh, Rangers fans leaving. But then Rangers makes also a few changes. But Rangers are completely folding. And Salah has a hat-trick within six minutes, which is now the fastest Champions League hat-trick. Harvey Elliott adds a seventh one. That result is not fair to how the game went. I also also think that Giovanni from Boris might uh, might be in trouble at Rangers after such, such results. Speaking of non-fair results, Leverkusen did not deserve. Deserve is not something you speak in football, but he did not. They did not deserve to lose three 0 at home to Porto. Okay, going down a goal can happen. However, then they pressed forward. 
uh, created chances, got a penalty that of course Demir Bay misses again. And this was the same movie that they had last week where in, in Porto they also were very well in the game but they missed a the penalty. Then they score a goal through Schick but there's a handball there. Uh, it, it was just whatever they did they couldn't get it done and then they uh, give up two really stupid penalties and both penalties the referee didn't see initially so it had to be uh, corrected which also doesn't speak for the quality of, uh, of, of the ref and Taremi uh, converts both of them but I literally have to say it was not a really deserved result. Uh, about deserved or not, I don't want to say with Barca. I mean, in the first half, it was exactly the game that I expected it to be, where Inter just tried to make it tight and Barca uh, tried to overwhelm them as well as they could. And yeah, I have to say, Inter's goal, Inter does have, have, in my opinion, a goalkeeping issue because Onana also doesn't look really good. He might be better with, with, with the feet than Han, Han, Handanovic. But I gotta say, the first goal in the 4th minute, uh, how Sergio Roberto can play it into Dembele and neither goalkeeper or defender can uh, get to the ball, that didn't look right. Barca created, I give it all credit again, especially for many chances, could have been maybe led by a bigger margin. However, Inter made the right adjustment and actually targeted the Barca defense in their few counterattacks that they have. And the Barca defense is an absolute shambles. I mean, PK doesn't look only old, he looks completely out of the game at, the, at this moment. And uh, whoever was playing back there, it just doesn't look good. The only one that is Ter Stegen, who actually made a few good saves. The goal by Barella was a brilliant one to give Inter an equalizer. And then Lautaro Martinez, every Barca fan must have gasped for air. The way this goal went in, Lautaro takes a shot, it hits the left post, the right post goes in. And that actually summed up uh, all the luck that Barcelona needed. It was not there. Because on other days, from second post, it goes out. Uh, Barca got um, desperate. Put on De Jong. Put on Ansi Fati. Uh, put on Frank Kessie. I mean, in this game, I think you should have Frank pay, played Frank, Frank Kessie from, from the beginning to have a little bit more oomph in the center of the park. But hey, I, I just know Frank, Frank Kessie. Also, a little bit deserved for him to not get any playing time now uh, after he uh, proclaimed that he will stay with Milan. Yeah, good, 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 you there. I didn't make that, that move. Lewandowski then gets an equalizer. At that point, I actually uh, thought that there might be enough for them to turn around. Not, I don't want to say that I necessarily wanted a turnaround because of everything I said, I said, I said before, but you know, my instincts kicked in. Yeah, maybe, maybe Barca can do it. Maybe Barca can do it. And they were surely pushing. However, they are again caught on a car counter attack. Uh, Velatro Timantinez finds Gossens, who puts it into net 89th minute. It's 3 2. And at that point, I thought Inter gonna win this. And now here I have to blame Inter. They did not see this game out. Yes, the equals of a brilliant header uh, and Eric Garcia, who has otherwise been an absolute shambles uh, defen defensively, uh, gets the assist for that. But to be honest, Inter should have killed off the game uh, by keeping the ball, putting it into the car, not hand the ball back to Barca. Uh, however, also, Aslani came, came on, had a glorious chance to score a fourth for Inter if it just passes over. No, he wants to get the glory him himself. So in many ways, Inter probably should have won this game. That they didn't also doesn't speak well for them. But... They are now in pole position in that group. Uh, for Bay Bayern's win over Pil Pils is noteworthy for three things. Uh, first off, Goretzka get, getting a brace. Thomas Müller actually uh, injuring him himself at, when assisting Goretzka's first goal. And that Bayern for the first time conceded two goals in the second half. It was 4-0 at the halftime through Vulcanova and Clement. Uh, so Pilsen actually broke that deadlock. But we also need to talk about Group uh, D, as I said, the craziest group out there. Sporting OM. 2-0. Yeah, for red cards. Sporting won 2-0 uh, on the pitch on with goals. Uh, Marseille won 2-0. That Marseille actually twice win convincingly against Sporting did come a little bit unexpected, but in both cases, early red cards set the tone with Esgayo getting two yellows in very short succession, giving away a penalty, Guendouzi, who I don't think, he thinks of a, that he's a much better player than he actually is. I wouldn't have one, I have them near my team, but okay. He, I think he fits very well with Marseille in many ways. Uh, makes it 1-0 and then uh, Sanchez 
Uh, 10 times less AMX makes 2 0, and the game is settled. And then Pedro Gonzalez gets himself side side off for two yellow cards. First, he is um, making a stupid challenge, then he argues with the referee, bang bang, and off you go. Again, I think a little bit. The referee could have let that go. I hate cards like that. Uh, then Marseille, knowing that I have to play PSG on the weekend, take out all the big guys, and you know, with uh, two men more, we'll see that game home, and that was that. And probably the best game that nobody's talking about, uh, in uh, the best ties I have, have to say, both both ties, is uh, Spurs against Frankfurt. The first one was already quite entertaining, although it ended nil nil. The second one had the goals. And it was largely Spurs that can't control. However, uh, Frankfurt was were always dangerous. They took the lead through Kamada, where I have to say, the way that Rode assists it, uh, it was that um, uh, Lloris saved the ball. It falls back to Rode, who could have taken a shot there. But he sees Kamada in a better position, who, who can pull it in, 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 into the empty net. However, you know, if you have Kane and Son up front, it is really, really uh, a different proposition. And those two uh, turn the game around for Spurs. First, Son being sent by Kane uh, makes it 1-1. Then Kane converts a penalty. And every, and the second goal by Son in the 36 was just a brilliant volley. Uh, absolutely loved that one. Then he really thought things are not going well for Frank with Tutor being sent off. But somehow that even helped them. Because they then uh, got more active, got a goal back and uh, Spurs were reeling there. I'll, I'll, I'll do in the 80, 87. Then Spurs get the reprieve with Kane uh, getting a penalty and puts it over the bar. I haven't seen Kane missing many penalties to be honest. Uh, and then Yuris needed to make one one more save. So Spurs hanging on at, at the end game 10 Frankfurt, uh, 10 men Frankfurt. So that was an interesting game. Um, I fear that Frankfurt will not make it out of this group, but they still have it in their own hands. Um, so let, let us look at the chances everywhere. Um, and through the groups in the standings, we have Napoli ahead of Liverpool. Liverpool just need a point against Ajax, which they play next. I guess they will get that one. Uh, and even then, you know, Ajax, I mean, yeah, Liverpool have to play Napoli. It could get tight, but I really don't see Liverpool not qualifying from, from, from that one. And the percentages uh, bear that out as well. Um, Club Rouge is already through. Uh, Porto in a better position in Atleti and Bayer Leverkusen, but it's by no way, uh, no way a done deal. But Porto are actually the big winners. That's why they're up there. Although they really didn't look good. Um, Bayern and Inter also more or less through. I mean, Inter need a home win against Pilsen. And now the only thing I can, can say is that Inter have a really bad re re record of sealing such an advance at home. That's the only thing. Uh, that That's the one hope that, Bayern, uh, that Barcelona have. But they need to also get a win against Bayern. So uh, it's... Let's see. Group D, wide open. Uh, of course, Spurs are favored. Uh, Sporting still holding the advantage uh, over Marseille a little bit, but uh, Marseille, of course, holding the head-to-head. -head. So that's going to be an interesting one for sure. And I wouldn't count out Frankfurt as well. Um, group uh, E, yeah, Chelsea and Salzburg, the favorites ahead of Milan. Hurts a little bit. However, Milan very much has it in their own hands, but they need to get a win in Zagreb. But Zagreb also will need that win. So, very, very big game that, unfortunately, I potentially will not see live out uh, because I will be um, in two weeks uh, traveling. So, I not, I don't know about that, but I'll talk about that at the end. Real Madrid through Le Leipzig now hold, holding the advantage over Schachter. However, Schachter will probably have the head-to-head. -head. So, a uh, lot coming down to the last game there. Um, City through Dortmund more or less through. I think they will get, get it done. Uh, although, they have to play City next. But then, you know, in Copenhagen... I think it should, it should be done and also PSG and Benfica. I don't think it either. Juve Maccabi will make it through there. As for the winners of the losers of the match day, Porto, Leipzig, Chelsea, Inter, I think it all they all make sense. Even OM may make sense uh, in a way. And then, you know, you see the rest. As for, for the losers, it's basically the other teams. Uh, Zagreb, Milan, Schachter, Barca, Sporting and 
Leverkusen are definitely on the losing side there. As for overall favorites, uh, it's still City. I was surprised to see Liverpool move up, but I guess their chances of uh, qualifying have significantly improved. So suddenly they are in. Uh, they are ahead of Bayern and PSG, although I don't necessarily see them ahead of Bayern, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, Club Bruges uh, is in there, but relatively low at the 15 spots. But, you know, they're at least in there. Uh, Barcelona barely hanging on. Barely hanging on, but still in there. Because if they make it, they might as well make, make, make a run, but it looks very unlikely. Again, next set of fixtures. I probably will do some shorts, but not in this studio, because I will be traveling. But you might get a short video here and there, but I'm not sure how much I, I, I will I'll see. And I don't know how I will do a review video. Uh, I may do one, but it will come out relatively late. So just as a heads up. Um, but... You know, I deserve a slight vacation as well. Um, on the Tuesday, we have the, you know, Salzburg Chelsea is already a pretty big match of anything in that group. is has a major weight. Dortmund probably need a, need, need a draw against City. And uh, Benfica Juve is a do or die game for Juve that they will probably not do any, any, anything there. Uh, I think Wentz is probably even a little bit more intriguing. Last guess for Ajax. We know already that Inter uh, need only a win. Need only a win. Yeah, only. It's never easy. Uh, we have Barca against Bayern, which is nominally the big fixture. But, uh, you know... If Inter do the job, there's not much to play for. And Bayern actually could do the job for Inter. Uh, and then Frankfurt, Marseille. I think this is more or less already for a second spot there. Because I would be surprised if Spurs don't win against Sporting. Although Spurs also a little bit. So yeah, this was a lengthy review video. But there are so many things to talk about. And it's I, I think it's totally worth it to spend the time on this. Please. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like these. Drop a line below if you want to add anything to what I can say. You know, I would hear to, uh, love to hear your opinion on Barca as well. And in any case, I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting the little bell icon so to get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.